Well, good morning. How's, how's everybody doing? Great. It's good to see you. Welcome to all of you watching online and those of you here at our Kernersville location. So great to be with you. Our mission is to receive and share the love of Jesus. So thank you so much for being a part of this. My name's Eric. It's great to have you. If this is the first time that you're here, and I know some of you are like, oh, you know, let's go to church. We need to find a church home. Maybe, you know, you're the guy and you got drug here and you didn't really want to be here. Or you're the wife and you're like, well, we need some church in our life or, you know, whatever. We understand that we've got some new people here. And we're just so thankful for that. Thank you for being here. We're, we hope you're encouraged today. And uh, as you leave, make sure you get your free mug. It is outside on the patio with people wearing yellow shirts. And uh, if you brought somebody, you get one too. So, hey, welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here. Hey, I want to bring uh, your attention to uh, something on the screens real quick. We have a groups event that is coming up this, uh, is that Saturday? It's May 5th on Saturday. Is that right? Friday. Uh-oh, Friday. May 5th is on Friday. Now you're, now you're going to remember. At Triad Park, if you lead a group or you are in a group, make sure that you get to this event at Triad Park. We're going to have a taco bar. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to have bounce castles. Um, we're going to have pinatas. You never know what you're going to find at our group's event. So make sure that you are there. It's going to be amazing. Now, you guys are smart people. I want you to take out your smartphone for just a second. Uh, and go into your Summit Church app, and we want to make sure that you always stay up to date with the latest stuff on the Summit. Like for like last weekend, we had a whole power outage here in this building, and it was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to get let people know? Well, if you get onto our app and you um, go into our, our, your notification section, you'll be aware of things like that. So uh, pull up your phone, go into these three little lines right here. You click on that, and then go into your settings, and it'll all your notifications of whatever you want to choose, you can set if you want to find out everything going on at all of our campuses, just check them all. We just want to make sure that you know what's going on. Now, I want everybody to take a deep breath. Breathe in with me. It's been a crazy week. A lot has happened this week, good, bad, and ugly, indifferent, whatever. But hey, we want to challenge you to connect with your Heavenly Father in the next few minutes, and we're going to go to Him in worship. So everybody stand, and let's worship our great God today. My name is Anthony, and this is me. I just want to invite you guys to sing with us. Let's sing loud. Sing together, sing, Son of God.
Now reveal 
sweet name. Lord, thank you that that is a name that we can run to when nothing else seems to go right, Father. Thank you that that is a name that holds us up in your right hand, saying it's, I've got you. You're good. We're going to get through this, Lord. Thank you that that is a sweet, sweet name. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. What's up, 10 o'clock, how are you? So glad you're here and I want to welcome all of you, everybody joining us at our other locations and everybody that's joining us live online. We are super excited to be in this series. This is week two. If you missed week one of this series we're doing called OMG, I want to tell you, you need to go back and catch up on the app or catch up online at the, through the website so that you're up to speed and we all can kind of track through this process together. OMG. What is this series about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's about us addressing our assumptions, our versions of God that don't really exist. And here's what I mean by that. As we talked about last week, you know, even if you believe that God exists, Eventually, if you're not careful, you will adapt an idea of God, a version of God, an understanding of God that could be inaccurate or at best incomplete. And this is way too big of a deal to get wrong. So we want to get this, get this right. And I'm going to warn you, we're going to touch a nerve in the next few minutes. So buckle up and get ready. Uh, this is what we need. Uh, if you spend any time around kids, um, you're going to identify with what I'm getting ready to say. Even if you don't have kids, maybe it's a grandkid kind of thing, which would mean you also have kids. But uh, maybe it's an <laughs> maybe you're an aunt or an uncle, or you know you got a little baby cousin kind of thing, or you babysit. Or and here's the deal: we've all been kids, I promise you. And so this is something all of us should be able to identify with. There's this thing that kids say when they don't get what they feel like they deserve. There's this thing that kids say. No one teaches them how to say it. They just know how to say it when they don't get what they want, especially if they see somebody else get it. Oh, here it is, and, and we've all heard it. We hear that not, come on, help me. Oh, oh, that's just not fair. Oh, I don't. The irritating refrain of childhood is like pouring acid in a parent's ears. <laughs> Isn't it? That's not fair. That's not fair. And then they throw, that's not fair. Parents, grandparents, doesn't that just make you want to sit the kid down and for the next 30 minutes go off on a dissertation 
Oh, let me tell you about fair. You want to know about fair? I haven't done anything for me in the last five years. I don't sleep. I can't go to the bathroom. I can't do anything. Blah, 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 blah. Don't you talk to me about what's fair, right? I just feel that. And for some of you, that's therapeutic right now. And so it's free counseling session, everybody. That's not fair. But let's not pick on the kids. Because I feel that. You feel that. As middle schoolers, high schoolers, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 60-somethings, we feel that frustration. And you know where it comes from? It comes from the thinking that people should get what they deserve. Right? Whether it's good, whether it's bad, people should always get what they deserve. If they got good coming their way, they should get it. If they got bad coming their way, too bad, so sad, they should get what they deserve. Everybody should get what they deserve. That's the thinking that drives the, that's nah, not fair. You ready? Now enter God into this conversation. And we assume that God is fair. And that God is always fair. And that God should always be fair. And we would say we would want God to be fair. Oh, but wait a second, wait a second. It's very important. According to our definition of what fair is, right? I mean, that's what we really want. We want God to line up with our definition of what fair is on the good side and the bad side, right? Because let's be honest, your idea of what's fair and I, my idea of what's fair is often different. And your idea of what's fair and your idea of what's fair and what's not is often different and it changes, right? It changes based upon what's happening and it, it changes based upon what we ate for supper and, and it changes based upon how we feel because we're quirky like that, right? And we change our minds like that because we're human. We want God to be fair. We want God to be our version of fair. Now, time out real quick. I don't think that's what we want. I don't think we really want God to be fair. To be honest, I don't think we want God to be completely fair with me or you or any of us. You know what we want? We want God to be merciful to us and gracious to us when we don't deserve it. Because if God was fair and gave us exactly what we deserve, we may not like that. And you know what we want? We want God to bless us more than we deserve. And if God just gave us exactly what we deserve and he was completely fair and he gave us exactly what we deserve, there would be a lot of blessings that you and I would miss out on. Have you ever been blessed beyond what you deserve? If God's fair, then you don't get that. So you and I really don't want, we don't want God to be completely fair. Well, actually, and this is getting really personal, what we want is we want God to be completely fair to everybody else except us. And God, you give them what they deserve. And you give me more than what I deserve and better than what I deserve, right? We're, we're just all over the place. And we assume that God always does what is good, what we think is good, right? And what we think is fair and what we think is right and what we think is appropriate. In response to all good things and in response to all bad things, Essentially, we have adopted a nice guy view of God. That God always does what the nice guy does. But that's just who he is. It's just what he does. God's a nice guy. And as the nice guy God, he is kind and he is loving and he is good to people when they deserve it. And he is wrathful. And he throws down his judgment when people deserve it, according to our definition of what people deserve. You I mean you got to be honest? We use ourselves as a point of reference. We talked about this last week. And we use each other as a point of reference. And then we get frustrated with God. We say, hey, that's not fair. We assume God should always do what is good and right and fair and appropriate, but it's always run through our own filter. And here's how we know we do this. Here's how we know we embrace this inaccurate, incomplete view of God. Because eventually, something's going to happen. 
that you don't like, that you don't agree with, and that you don't understand. Eventually, something in the world around you is going to happen. A tragedy, something bad, a natural disaster. Somebody's going to hurt somebody else. Somebody's going to take advantage of somebody else. Some innocent person is going to be taken advantage of. Something's going to happen in the world that you don't like, that you don't agree with, and that you don't understand. What's more, and what's more personal, is one day in your own life, and you're going to look in the mirror, and something's going to happen to you that you don't like, that you don't agree with, and that you don't understand. And maybe right now, in your life, things are going on that you don't like, and that you don't agree with, and that you don't understand. And then out Out of the depths of your soul, from the back corners and recesses of your mind, will pour forth this question. How could a good and loving God, and then you fill in the blank. You ever felt that? You know why you ask that question? Because you assume that God is always good and fair according to your definition of what good and fair is. And so when something happens that you don't like and that you don't agree with and that you don't understand, you say, wait a second, time out. How could a good and loving God, and you fill in the blank. You look at the world around you and the injustices that are happening, and the sex trafficking, and the war, and the evil, and the pain, and you just feel the refugees, how people are being taken advantage of, and you look at all this stuff, and you go, how could a good and loving God? Or maybe you look in your own life, your own pain, your own suffering, and say, how could a good and loving God? If I were to come up to you, and it'd just be me and you having a conversation just one-on-one, and I were to pose you this question, how could a good and loving God, then I guarantee you, you would know how to finish that. You would know how to finish that. You wouldn't have any problem finishing the question, how could a good and loving God? Now, it may be different for all of us how we would finish that question, but you will finish it. In fact, it's been a topic of conversation, I bet, between you and your family, those you and you love, and those that are your friends. We assume that if God exists, he's both good and loving. Well, of course, now our definition of good and loving, and this is why many people don't believe in God. Do you know this is why many people have walked away from God and walked away from the local church? This is why many of you, this is the first time you've been back in church in years because you wrestle with the how could a good and loving God, how could he let this happen? How could he not do this? How could he not stop this in the world and in my own life? This is the question that many people hide behind. Because see, you've experienced it. Some of you have friends and you invite them to church. Hey, why don't you come to church with me? And you know what they'll say? They'll say, let me tell you why I don't go to church. How could a good and loving God, and then they fill in the blank. Let me tell you why I don't want any of you Jesus. Let me tell you why I don't want none of your religion. How could a giving look good? And they'll point to something in the news. They'll point to something in the world. Or they'll point to something in their own life. Are you tracking with me? See, this is real. This is that nerve that gets touched. And it doesn't feel so good. But it's where we live. How could a good and loving God? It turns the non-Christian into a skeptic. It's why many Christians are discouraged and they question their faith. Many followers of Jesus think God is either being too kind in certain situations or way too hard in certain situations. So they say, how could a good and loving God? As they look at the world, as they look in their life with the evil, the pain, the injustice, the suffering, and say, this is not what I hoped for, this is not what I prayed for. How could a good and loving God? And the reason you ask this question, and the reason I wrestle with this question, is because we assume that God is good and fair according to our definition of what good and fair is, which changes, by the way. And so whatever the flavor of the day is, we pass judgment on a holy God and say, how could you, if you're so good and you're so loving, let me just be straight up honest with you. Doesn't it bother you when I say that? It's like, did, were you just shooting bull for the last 
however many minutes. Now you're going to be straight up honest with me? And I always think it's funny when people say, I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm like, as opposed to what you just said? <laughs> okay. All right. I just needed to break the, the moment just a little bit because it's getting kind of. Here's the honest truth. Nice guy God does not exist. And that's a good thing. You know why? Because nice guy God is a limited view of God. And it limits God to our understanding and our opinion and our experience. And we talked about last week, he's holy. He is totally other, set apart, above and beyond anything we could fully grasp or understand. So when we take a holy God, and put him in our terms and use our terminology and explanations to put him in a box and say, how could a good and loving God? You see, that version of God does not exist. What's the correct view? Glad you asked. What's the correct view of a holy God? It's better than nice. God is just. Just what? just. God is just. And this is what this means. God is morally right. And here it is. God is fair. Hold on. But according to his definition of what fair is, which is really the definition that counts. Ultimately, that's the definition that matters most. God is just which means he's better than nice. He's greater than just nice. He's better than just good according to our definitions. No, he is just. Let me show you. It's all throughout the scriptures and it's so clear time after time after time again, we see this. In the Old Testament, we find that God, he is the rock. I love that. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. He is just and upright. How just and upright he is. He does no wrong. Not by me, not by you, not even when we think he has. Now, you wouldn't come out and say it. I may not come out and say it, but how many times have we felt I think God missed it on this one. I don't get why God's doing this. I don't get why God's allowing this. This makes no sense to me. So we take a holy and just God and we run him through our own filter. And what pops out on the other side is how could you, God? How could a good and loving God? And what the scriptures teach us, we need to be very careful there because he is perfect and he does no wrong. In the, in, and later on in the Old Testament, King David writes, for the word of the Lord holds true. And we can trust, I love this, we can trust everything he does. Everything. Even when we don't like it, even when we don't agree with it, even when we don't understand it, we can trust everything he does. And he loves whatever is just, there's that word again, and good, his definition of good, the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. David says it again later on in the book of Psalms. He says, the Lord is righteous, here's his word again, in everything he does. But here's the cool thing. God's justice is not just about the past and it's not just about the present. God will ultimately prove that he is just. We find in the New Testament that God has set a day in the future for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and that man is Jesus. There is a day in the future, and I don't know when it is, and you don't know when it is, and we don't know when it's going to happen, but there will be a day in the future when God says, I'm going to set it all right. And anything that hasn't been made right is going to be made right. And anything that is left undone, I'm going to finish. And anything that's not left final, I'm going to finalize. There is a day in the future when God will give his son Jesus the opportunity to judge all good and all evil. 
God is just. He's morally right and he's fair. According to his definition, not by ours, which is a good thing because we keep changing our minds what we think is right and what was good and what's fair, don't we? Now see, God is a rock. And God being just, get this, allows God to fully and appropriately respond to everything that's good in the world and in your life and allows God to appropriately respond to everything that's evil in the world and everything that's evil in your life. Everything that's right and everything's wrong. God can appropriately and correctly respond to all of it. If God needs to be kind and patient, God can be kind and patient. If God needs to be wrathful and quick about it, he can do that. Because that's the kind of God he is. I want, I want to share something with you, and you might want to write this down. You might want to take a picture of it. Because this is something you need to remember. When you are looking at a situation in the world that's causing you to go, well, if God is just, how could a good and loving God? Or if you're looking at a situation in your life and it may be a relationship thing, it may be a health thing, it may be a job thing, a money thing, or a tragedy thing, you know, anxiety, depression thing, personal, has something to do with somebody else that's close to you that you love, and you find yourself wrestling with, how could a good and loving God? Then understand this, he is just. And whatever it is you're looking at that brings up the question of his justice, just remember this. Three things. Not yet, not fully, not finally. Not yet, not fully, not finally. God is just. He will settle the score. He will take care of it. He will make it right. He will deal with good. He will deal with evil. And as you look at it, it could be you're just not seeing it yet. Not yet, but don't assume he's not going to do it. And I can promise you, not fully, because God's not done. He's still at work. And we've been told, we just read it, that the day's coming in the future when he will set it all right. So not finally, not yet, not fully, not finally. Now here's why this is important. Are you ready? When we get frustrated with God, nice guy version of God, you know why we get frustrated? Because we want God to be just now. Now, dang it. Right? Or whatever you say. <laughs> we look at things in the world and we want God to act now. And when he doesn't act on our timetable, we assume, how could a good and loving God? We want God to fix it now. We want God to make it right now. We want God to bless the way we want it to bless now. We want God to judge the way we want him to judge now. I'm going to say to you, it's a good thing. He doesn't do a lot of this now. You're assuming that that would always work out well for you. Could it be that God's wanting to be patient? And isn't that a good thing? Well, well, yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, it's a good thing when it's pointed in your direction, isn't it? But see, we, want, we don't want God to be patient with everybody else. You know what the scriptures tell us? That God is patient with everybody. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. The reason it's not happening now could be that God is wanting to be patient to give them an opportunity to turn back to him. It could be that God is not being just in a way that you can see right now because God is letting things simmer because he knows there's a better way to deal with this later. There's a better way to make this right later. Not yet, not fully, not finally. You know, the reason we really struggle with this, and just real quick, I got to show you this. The, the reason we really struggle with this, this whole thing of God being just, there's a reason for this. And just follow me real quick. When, when we think of the word just, we automatically think of the word justice, right? Okay. When we think of the word justice, we automatically think of judge. 
Someone who decides justice, someone who hands out justice, someone who decides, you know, and, and makes settlements and, and, and decisions based upon good and evil and right and wrong. So ultimately, when we think of a judge, we are messing with and thinking about and wrestling with authority. And this, my friends, is what our real problem is. Authority. We struggle with authority. I don't struggle with authority. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You don't like being told what to do. You don't want to be told what to do. You struggle with authority. I struggle with authority. And if you are sucking oxygen on this planet, you struggle with authority. This is such a big deal. Listen carefully. This is such a big deal, this authority thing, that this coming fall, 2017, in the fall of 2017, we're going to circle back around to this, and we're going to do an entire series on authority. We're going to talk about God's authority, government authority. We're going to talk about authority in the family. We're going to talk about authority in the workplace. And we're going to talk about how God wants us to approach this whole idea and reality of authority. But I'll just tell you this. I'll say it now. You'll hear it later again. That authority is a good thing because authority brings protection and blessing. There is a protection and a blessing when you are under authority and I am under authority and everyone is under authority that only comes because we're under authority. But you know what this is really about? That God is just the justice of God is that he is the judge. He is the ultimate and final authority. He decides what's good. He decides what's fair. He decides what starts, what stops, who goes where, who does what. And so our question, how could a good and loving God, is really bumping up against the ultimate authority of God. And that is where we struggle. You know why we struggle with it? Because God doesn't always do what we would do. God doesn't always allow what we would allow. And so when God does and allows what we don't like, what we don't agree with, and what we don't understand, what are we going to do in response? I'll tell you this. Every time, every single time, you and I try to sum up God in a box and fully explain what he does, what he doesn't do, every single time. We try to fully understand what God is doing and not, and then we comment on it. It's going to lead to frustration every single time. Remember we talked about last week, uh, the prophet Isaiah helped us understand where God said, my ways are up here, and in comparison, your ways are down here, and my thoughts and the way I think and do things is up here, and in comparison, the way you think and do things are down here, and there's a gap between how we live and how God is. That gap is never going away. Not on this side of heaven. Not on this earth. That gap is never going to go away. So every time you try to explain or understand or put God and summarize him in a box and say, how could a good and how could a loving God do? Because I think he should have done this. And I don't understand why he doesn't do this. Every single time you and I enter that exercise, it's going to end in frustration. Because he is a holy and just God who will surprise you and confound you. The Apostle Paul says it like this. I love this. One of my favorite passages in the entire scripture. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So when you try to trace them out, you're going to end frustrated. Does this mean we don't try to understand? No, we're going to try. That's how we're made. We want to understand things. But just understand, we're not going to fully understand. So that brings us to this. How then do we not get attached to this nice guy version of God that doesn't exist? So how do we then respond to the fact that God is just? Well, here it is. And again, I encourage you. Take your phone out, write this down, or take a picture of it, and I leave you with these thoughts. God knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what to do. 
and he always does what's best. God knows exactly what's going on. God knows exactly what to do, and he always, always, always does what's best. Whatever it is in your life right now or in the world that's got you asking the question, how could a good and loving God, because you always assumed he's just a nice guy, God, and you may not have said that and you would never call him that, but that's the way you treat him because you're so frustrated with him because he's not doing what you think is good and right and fair and appropriate. Okay, so you've got him in this nice guy category. No wonder you're frustrated. You need to bring that issue to the table and you need to remember, God knows exactly what's going on in that situation, exactly what's going on. And here's why this is important. You and I think we know what's going on. We like to talk like we know what's going on. We want everybody else to think we know what's going on. We got it figured out, man. That's why I'm so frustrated because if God would have done this and this, and that's why I'm praying and I don't understand why this and that, because I'll tell you one thing, if they would do this and if they would do that, and if that over there wouldn't have happened, then this wouldn't be a problem then everything would be set right. I tell you what, someone should listen to me, right? We think we know exactly what's going on, but most of the time we don't. So be at peace. God knows exactly what's going on. God also knows exactly what to do, exactly what to do. Now, you and I like to talk like we know exactly what to do. We rarely know exactly what we should do. God knows exactly what to do, and he's not done. Not yet. Not fully. Not finally. Not yet. Not fully. Not finally. You may have to remind yourself of this this week. Every time you get frustrated, you may have to tell yourself, this doesn't look right because it's not right. Not yet. Not fully. Not finally. God knows exactly what's going on. God knows exactly what to do. So I'm going to wait patiently. Yeah, everything inside of you and inside of me says now, 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 God. Well, maybe God's being patient. Maybe God's waiting to do it better later. See, God knows exactly what's going on in your life. God knows exactly what's going on in the world. Do you think he doesn't see? He sees everything that's good and everything that's bad and misses nothing. He knows exactly what's going on and what to do. And he always, always, always does what is best. Best for you. Best for me. He always does what's best even if it doesn't feel like it's best. Even if you don't like it. Even if we don't agree with it. Even when we don't understand it. God always does what's best. So let me talk to the skeptic just just quickly here. Some of you are like, man, that's that's bunk. That right there, that's why I don't believe. That is why I haven't been to church and I probably won't come back now. That, I don't need that. That doesn't work. God always knows what's going on. God always knows what to do, and he, and, and he always does what's best. Well, let me ask you. You got a better explanation? I'm not trying to be smart, Alec. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just entering into a, a, a conversation with you here. Do you have a better explanation of how this operates? And you may think, well, yeah, God doesn't exist. Oh, oh, oh okay. So, Really? So God now doesn't exist, and we're going to ignore the mountain of evidence that proves he does. So we're going to throw the whole thing away because God's existence doesn't line up with how you think God would be if God existed. And so now you're the judge. I don't know if I'd go down that road. I don't know if I like that one. I don't don't think you'd like that either. Maybe you're God. No, 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 it can't be, can't can't be, right? You got a better explanation? Well, then, if God exists and he's not good and he's not loving, really? Just because it doesn't line up with your definition of what's good? So, So you're the standard. Just because it doesn't line up with what your understanding of what fair is, so now we're the standard? Oh. 
Here's the truth. And here's what we have to come back to time and time and time again. God is just, which means he knows exactly what's going on. And he knows exactly what to do and he will do it. Maybe not yet. Maybe not fully. And ultimately, not finally, because that day hasn't gotten here yet. And God always, 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 always does what's best. You and I have got to trust in the ultimate authority and goodness and love of God, which is so much better than God being nice. God is just. So my invitation to you is a couple of things. Number one, be thankful that God (laughs) is not limited to your view and your understanding of what good and fair is. Because if God was good according to your good and, and my and my good and your fair and my fair, he would be all over the place, number one. Number two, we wouldn't that wouldn't work out too well with us. Be thankful. Secondly, whatever it is that is just aching within you, that's got you screaming, how could a good and loving God take that to him? Talk with him about it. Share that frustration with him. He can handle it. You're not going to freak God out. God is not going to be, you're not going to give God a bad day. I mean, after that prayer, God's not going to go, I don't know what I'm going to do now. (laughs) No, he knows, he knows, he knows. You know what the scriptures tell us? He knows that we're made of dust. That ain't too impressive. So when we come to him with dust thinking and dust opinions, God's like, come on, I can handle it. I get it. Not yet. Not fully, not finally. Trust me, I know exactly what's going on. I'm not missing any of it, and I know exactly what to do, and I will do it. Maybe not yet, maybe not fully, and ultimately not finally, because that day is not here. So you need to trust me that I always do what's best for you, and you, and you. I don't know of a better option. He is just. Let me pray for you. Our Father... Oh, we need this. Uh, I need this. This reminder of who you are. You are just morally right. You do no wrong. You're perfect. Everything you do is trustworthy and fair, even when it doesn't match my definition. So God, help me to throw my definition out the door and help us to discard of our own opinions and definitions of of trying to put you in some kind of a box that only leads to frustration and a limited view of who you are. And may we just trust that you always know what's going on. You always know what to do, and you always do what's best. You are just. There are people in this room and listening and watching online um, that are suffocated by the question of how and why could a good and loving God? And those are real feelings and real questions. Father, may that lead us to trust. May that lead us to embrace past the gap that separates what you know and what we know and what you understand and what we understand. And may we just hold on to the reality that you are holy and that you are just and you have our best interest at heart. Help us to trust you even when it's hard, especially when it's hard, and even when it hurts, knowing that that's what's best for us today, tomorrow, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, that's the nerve. I I challenge you to and encourage you to use this to um, strike conversations up with your friends. Maybe, you know, talk with them a little bit about this and just, and I know it's uncomfortable kind of thing, but this is reality. This is where we live and this is why we're doing this series. Next week, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next week and then I've got to make an announcement, uh, just kind of a last minute thing. Um, next week, we're going to talk about the let's make a deal God. The version of God that we've adopted where God's a little bit temperamental, but you can strike a deal with him if you know what you're doing. You got to know what you're doing. You got, you got to know how it works, right? And you'd be surprised how many of us operate with that view of God all the time. So we don't need to miss this one. Invite somebody and bring them with you. And here's the announcement. 
uh, uh, they let me know before I came on stage that we had to close down a section of the peak because of overcrowding and a lack of volunteers. That's our preschool department. So if you were turned away, I am so, so sorry. We don't want to turn away anybody, especially first-time guests. And so if, if you've had a less than experience because you weren't able to be served by the peak, um, here's what I need everybody to do. Number one, okay, look around. This place is packed, and that's fun, and that's cool, and we love it, and we're so glad you're here. But we need some more, we need some more empty seats. So we just need to leave, you to leave and never come back, okay? <laughs> no, no, are you kidding me? No, come to the 830 service. Get up a little bit earlier. Or come to the 1130 service. All three services are identical. Um, the 830 service has more elbow room in it because, you know, it's just it's fewer people. And Jesus, he shows up at the 830 service. He takes up a whole section by himself, and he sits over there. But no, I've just, no, 830 service, there's room there. And the 1130 service, there's room there. And the other thing, the other thing that will help this is if you are not volunteering somewhere here at the summit, why don't you volunteer in the peak? It's a great team of volunteers. Any peak volunteers in the house? In the house, yeah, some of the greatest volunteers we have. You see, we need more of them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next week for the next week of OMG.